my goodness. <laughs> oh, we need to get this fixed. Yeah, I, I wondered because I was having issues with my Google account yesterday, and I was just trying to drop links in the chat, and they weren't working. So I'm wondering if it's a Google, and I have no idea what's happening. But we're going to get this figured out. And thank you all very much for hanging in there with us. Really. <laughs> Again, technology is great when it works, but goodness. <laughs> I want us all to remember this when we are all promising each other that telehealth is the solution and we <laughs> solve the problem. Okay. Um, Every person in rural Colorado <laughs> wants you to know that telehealth is not the solution. Please, I will shout it from the rooftops. This is why. Try doing crisis management when your Zoom's not working. Ooh, that would that would definitely be hard. Okay. Um, let's. So my question that. was really for BHA though, right? It's for you guys because if you're seeing the bylaws and we do the committee and we get all the bylaws perfect for BPAC and we're just like we love them so much. However, y'all are standardizing standardizing them across the councils. Um, does that mean that then you say to like C-Y-M-H-T-A, I think that I got all those letters no, out of my mouth, thank you, um, and the BHAC and um, the other fabulous councils that the BHA oversees. So so like how do you standardize it if like BHAC has one really good idea and C-Y-M-H-T-C-Y-M-C-A, <laughs> everybody do it. Um yeah, well, yeah, thank you. Um, but like, how do we do that, right? If everyone wants their own bylaws, right. but then BHA is also standardizing them, how do we rectify so, those two pieces? I think the word standardizing is not the correct word. I think that when we originally thought of that, that we've realized that that is not the correct terminology that we need to be using moving forward. So that's why we're not standardizing bylaws anymore. What I had sent out is this first draft of bylaws with um, uh, basically the requirements around statute. Um, basically kind of what we're trying to lay out is, you know, membership requirements, um, the rules of chair and vice chair and things of that nature. So that is the standardized part is just, you know, the terminology around roles, responsibilities, statutes, and things like that. We're working with each council individually to really tailor it to that specific council. So the first draft is that standardized bylaw, but moving forward, it's going to be individualized with some standardization pieces within it, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you. Of course. So, yes, um, you know, I'm. if you guys want to go ahead and vote on a subcommittee today, if that's something that everybody would like to do, um, I am happy to, to start facilitating that and we can set up, we can start doing some doodle polls to see, you know, who's available, who would like to participate. Um, you all tell me, you know, I, I'm the administration piece. I'm just helping to organize and, you know, just facilitate and answer the questions. But I think that, you know, it, it's, we need to work together to, you know, to build these out more. And, you know, basically, um, as long as BHA can comply um, with the request, well, again, we'll take it to our AG and make sure that everything's good there. Um, but, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just squirrel brain today. Um, so, yeah, so we'll we'll just kind of keep working together and building these out until you all feel comfortable. Um, and we can get, you know, at least a two-thirds majority vote because this is your council. These are your bylaws. We, again, the standardized part is just um, basically the statue and things of that nature, but yeah, whatever you guys need within your specific roles, responsibilities of this exact council, let's work together to build out. Okay, so the motion on the floor, as I understand it, is do we want to create a subcommittee to review, refine, and make totally awesome the bylaws for the BPAC? Is that correct, Dennis? Does that sound like the right motion? Okay, motion on the floor. All in favor of creating the committee for the bylaws? Sorry, I didn't do any discussion, but I feel like we just discussed. Um, we'll see a thumbs up from Nat. Okay. Thumbs up from Ben. Was that a question, Sharon, or a yes? Okay, yes. 
Thumbs up from Sharon. Any opposed? See no opposition. Motion carries, and we have a bylaw subcommittee. Um, just to clarify the um, the membership on that subcommittee, Dennis, based on your reflection, it was the executive committee and then whoever else wants to be a part of it. Was that your vision, Dennis? Okay, awesome. And then Marjorie has a question. Um, if council numbers are reduced, what role do you see non-members having or continuing to have in the council? So back to the bylaws question around numbers. What do you, can you explain on that a little bit more, Marjorie? Are you talking about, you know, kind of like your roles and responsibilities? I guess I just want to ensure that historically council has always um, encouraged non-members to participate, to have a voice at the table. If your numbers are council are going to be reduced, again, I think you probably, there's going to have to be some discussion of how many new people are going to be recruited if the number is reduced on how many people are in council. Absolutely. I think Lloyd will have. So there are those of us that if we're not picked to be on council still would like to have our voices heard at Absolutely. these meetings. And I'm just wanting to clarify and make sure that that is still the case for not just attending these meetings, but also for being on subcommittees. Yep. I recognize even in just this new group that is being, that's for council members. So there's going to be ones that'll be council only, but as many as could be open to non-members, I think is important to um, ensure that's that continues to happen. Absolutely. And again, the number is kind of referencing compensation. So if you're a non-member of the council, you wouldn't be qualified for compensation at that point, but your voice, your participation, your voluntary time, please, you know, keep coming, keep participating, keep enjoying. The, the number is just specifically with regards to um, active voting council members directly related to our compensation proposal. Um, so it, it wouldn't necessarily be limiting your participation, your involvement. Um, it would just be for the realm of compensation for the state and who is eligible for compensation, basically. Does that answer the question, Marjorie? question, Marjorie? Oh. <laughs> you know, I, I, I find maybe I'm just, and I'm just being honest, I find it sad that that number was reduced because of compensation. But I, I mean, I can certainly understand where the state has limited funds, but um, that's- I mean, this is uh, taxpayers' money and we were really trying to be, you know, mindful of that. Again, BPAC is still going to be our largest council by uh, I think eight members. Um, so this is still the absolute largest council that we have within BHA, but I do understand, um, you know, Basically, what we're trying to do with compensation is, you know, some councils are paid, some councils are not. We realize that this is extra time and effort for you all. Um, again, compensation is nothing crazy. Don't quit your day job. But we do recognize that you all are bringing expertise um, and that is valuable. Your time is valuable. And so that is kind of where we're wanting to create this standardized compensation proposal um standardized and that's it you know but um so that's that's kind of where we we had to create a limit unfortunately if I had all the money in the world I would just pay for everybody to join and you know be a part of this and that that's you know we want you to continue to be a part of it and we can have as many guest members as we want we can have, as long as the council approves um guest members joining on subcommittees we can absolutely do that it really just comes down to the fiscal numbers that we had to um, give in our proposal. And that was the maximum that we could actually afford. Dennis? Uh, yeah, I I think, again, we can have a work around that by creating a separate category. We can have a voting number of members and then have a subcategory that no more than 25 
members would, you know, would be able to apply for compensation or something along those lines so that we get a, enough variety and diversity in our voting so that, again, everyone can be represented rather than restricted and still be encouraging, you know, again, we wouldn't have had Margie or Lloyd, and I, I mean, they have been invaluable to my yeah. education on this council. Yeah. And they just stuck it out as non-members yep. and can't vote. So again, I believe that our subcommittee can do a workaround, make the state happy, <laughs> and still allow us to have a nice, expansive voting council. Definitely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Andrea will have her be part of those conversations. You know, unfortunately, I am a low man on the totem pole. And when it comes to anything fiscal, I can just kind of provide that information and just fingers crossed. And we're going to be getting a lot of feedback from them. Um, this is going to be an ongoing thing with compensation. Unfortunately, when it comes to money, it's just not, you know, black and white cut dry, but we can absolutely work to create proposals that we can take back to fiscal um, and, and just kind of keep keep going back and forth and um, until we can kind of get to a, to a point. Tasha? Um, yeah, I have a question. When it comes to like, cause I know there's other councils like with me with the BHAC, I am the voted representative liaison for BHAC to sit on, uh, to be a part of BPAC to report back and forth. Like I'm the one that bridges the gap. Um, I haven't done that because nobody's explained it. So I, I would like to see that addressed like in BPAC as well as BHAC on and any other council where there is that bridge to what exactly is entailed to those representative, those voted in members for, um, yeah. If I you follow me, I think I'm saying it. Oh, I think I do. Um, I don't know if we have that included in there right now because we're really trying to ensure compensation for each individual council. Um, and so I'm not sure if there's going to be like a crossover for compensation for liaisons. Is that where you're referring Compen to? No, no. Just no. the role and the responsibilities? Just the role and the responsibilities okay. and also to put in there because I know that would be, wouldn't that be maybe a conflict area? That's double dipping. Isn't that considered double dipping? Yes. Yeah. The, so for the it, yeah, if you were yeah for the compensation, right. but just to know that like just a little bit more explanation and clarification because, like I said, wording is everything, and it's all about per perception to people. Absolutely. So make sure if that's you can include that in the feedback form for um, I did you receive the one for B Hack as well or just B Hack? Just B Hack. Just B Hack. Okay, if you can include that on the B Hack, and you know. And what other other category? Just yeah, um, you know what kind of, what um the roles of council liaisons are and what's expected of that. Absolutely, we can definitely build that. In. So I know that we're definitely behind time, and I really want to get to um at least a little bit of the block grant um application subcommittee and just you know update the council as a whole on. Kind of where we are i know we have a lot of a little confusion and frustrations around that right now but i also think that we're having some great conversations and i just kind of wanted to point out a couple of the links in the agenda that everybody can access um so wanted to just kind of quickly jump to that but if there's any last minute comments questions concerns about bylaws at this moment All right, I'm not seeing any hands up or anybody on fire. So I think we're good to move. Oh, Charles. Yeah, just real quick. Um, we want to just make sure we point out that we, in the past, we've had issues with getting statewide representation. Mm -hmm. Somehow noting that either through the new BHA mapping or, or something, just to say that there's representation from all areas. Um, not quite sure how that would work, but um yeah so according to statute if you look at the membership there has to be um under article two number one um principal state agencies by law we have to have representation from 
mental health education, vocational rehabilitation, criminal justice, housing, and social services. Okay. So those are absolutely going to be categories that are filled. I know that some of the um, members of those representation haven't been consistent, and I have reached out to them individually. And um, we are addressing that because that is something that they, they need to be here. They need to be a participating member. Um, but other than that, if there is other representation from the state that you think would be valuable for us to include, please let us know. Please put that on the feedback form and we can start looking into that and working up through that together. Yeah, I'm just thinking geographically more, Caitlin, than anything, because we tend okay. to get concentrated you know, in the Denver area yep. and a lot of the rest of the state doesn't get included or thought okay. about. So, so more that, like rural rural community representation and things of that nature? Yeah, and I, I think just if we use the BHA map may be a good starting point just to make sure we have representation from the four regions that, yep. that makes that up. That sounds great. Yes, please put that in your feedback. Will do. Thank you. And in case, I wonder if we just include that as a topic of discussion for our bylaws subcommittee yep. when we um, convene. Um, yep. I think you're taking some notes, so yep. I'm asking. I will send out um, kind of like I did for the report subcommittee, um, just like the application package. If you want to volunteer um, to be a part of this, I will also reach out to the executive committee members. And um, we'll we'll work together to get a time and a date set, and we'll just kind of start these conversations, um, depending on your all's availability and schedule. And yeah, we'll we'll just keep this rolling. All right, Tasha. This is just another thing when it comes to representation and lived experience. Um, the clarification on that, because sitting in interviews and stuff like that through other things that I'm involved in. Um, safety net providers and professionals is that included in like if they've had like behavioral health does that um, so safety net providers included in the lived experience or is it just people like me of nothing but lived experience it, Andrea? Um, I think let me know if I get this wrong, but I think the concept of people presenting as the whole, their whole selves in general, you could be fulfilling that lived experience, like quality metric with any other number of representations as a safety net provider or a healthcare provider or something like that. Like there isn't a like I do, yeah, I do kind hard of barrier. See, yeah, I do kind of see your concern though, Tasha. If you're saying that like everybody with lived experience is also a provider, um, so oh, yeah, got you. So yeah, so I think that's that's more of their question is, um, you know, what role they're actually going, the seat position that they're actually going to fill. Um, I'm not 100% sure that we have that set in stone yet, but again, we can work together to finalize that and to create these, you know, specific seats, like maybe out of the 51%, you know, five of the seats can be a provider or, a, you know, um, safety net provider. So, and then after that, you know, so that that's something that we can actually work on together and finalize together because I do see your concerns there. We want everybody to represent themselves as a human as a whole. I know that I am a state employee, but I am also a person of lived experience. I also have my own, you know, but um, kind of making sure that there's not an uh, too much of one side. Um, I, I definitely get what you're saying. And that's what we can work on together. And this is the type of feedback we need. So thank you. All right, and seeing no other questions or comments, let's move on to the block grant application discussion in, in lieu of time. Um, Caitlin, did you want um, those of us on the subcommittee to just speak to it? Did you want to present some overarching statements around it? How do you want to do that? So I can present some overarching statements, and then if you all want to fill in the gaps and just kind of you know, explain what we've been doing in our meetings thus far, um, some of the, the issues that we're running into, because we definitely are, um, you know, some of the feedback that you'd like to seek from the council at this time, that would be great. 
Um, so basically just kind of wanted to revert back to the agenda. Um, is my screen still sharing? Because can you, no, okay. I was like, with how many times we've gotten on and off? <laughs> Heavens only knows, okay. So um, going back to the agenda that you all have received, um, just kind of wanted to point out some links in there that you all can access. So um, under the video recordings, all of our council meetings or subcommittee meetings, excuse me, have been recorded. So if this is something that you're interested in reviewing and kind of seeing, you know, the exact conversations that we have, um, please go feel free to go in and review those. Um, we also have linked here the BHA application draft. So that is the actual application that the subcommittee is reviewing. We've also linked the application reference guide. So that is our attempt at trying to support you all in this writing right now. Um, basically giving, unfortunately, very minimal context on you know where these numbers are and kind of how to look at that number. Um, that is why we have reached out to SAMHSA. That is why we have Anne is because, you know, we understand right now that it is just like a lot of numbers and that there's not a lot of context as to exactly what those numbers are, where these numbers are coming from. And so that is where we are asking for support um, from SAMHSA as well. And so just kind of wanted to remind this council, um, this is the first mini block grant application letter recommendation that we have done. We learned from SAMHSA a couple months ago that we were, we thought uh, that we were only supposed to have letters of recommendation for the full application every other year, but we learned that, nope, we have to have one for both the mini and the full. So this is something that is new to us as well. And so we know that there are a lot of bumps in this road and we are actively trying to work to get that resolved, um, both with your all's help and support. And just kind of want to remind you all that this is a trial by error situation. And I think that this this year specifically is going to be an amazing learning opportunity for all of us, um, both as BHA to present you with the information that you need um, in the way that you need it. And then, um, you know, learning together, you know, just how, how we want to do this in the future and to really prepare us for that huge block grant application next year. Um, so I just, you know, want to say, especially to the subcommittee members and to this council as a whole, you know, thank you for sticking with us. I know this road is bumpy. Um, you know, I wish that I just had all of the answers and just like this perfect guide to present to you, but I'm learning alongside of you and I just really appreciate your time and commitment and support of this council. Um, and so uh, here you can also see the letter of recommendation examples. So we have, I think it's about seven or eight different letters of recommendations from other states. Um, some of them are super detailed and involved, and then some of them are just kind of an overarching chirp, we give it. Um, so just kind of wanted to give you all a frame of reference on kind of where we are within the process. And um, also wanted to point out the letter of recommendation working document. Basically, that is kind of where we are starting to take notes and starting um, during each meeting to kind of come together and start, you know, coming up with our questions, coming up with our recommendations and things of that nature. Um, so all of that is available to you. If for some reason I have adjusted the settings, so they should be visible to everybody. But if you cannot view it for any reason, please contact me immediately and I will do everything in my power to get you that access. Um, so. In the meantime, I'm going to pass it back over to the report subcommittee. Thanks, Caitlin. I wanted to hand it over to Michael Miller, um, because I'm I'm kind of voluntolding you. I'm sorry if you don't want to report back. You don't have to, but you have very concise um, feedback, I believe. So, if you'd be willing to share with the group, sure. Uh, no problem. And. Hi, everybody. I haven't spoken a whole lot in meetings yet. Um, but as Megan just mentioned, a lot of the same questions we the, the council has, we have. Um, <clears throat> after uh, quite a bit of discussion and digging through the application, application requirements, and then the comparable letters from other states, planning and advisory councils. Uh, two things are really clear to me. One, 
we don't have a lot of time to really dig in <clears throat> and say, these are, these are all of our real specific recommendations because we need so much context, primarily in my opinion, from the program side of BHA around, uh, around what, what funding is actually being spent on to create really actionable recommendations. And in the absence of that, and recognizing that everyone, what I hear primarily from everybody on this council is that uh, the, the recommendation is increased transparency. And I think that what we're looking for, looking to accomplish in the next meeting, forgive me if I've got this wrong, somebody can correct me, is to identify some very specific, clear, brief um, areas where we are expecting additional transparency. And uh, I'm still just individually, I don't know if, I don't know if the committee's leaning this way uh, or not, but I'm still leaning towards essentially saying like, yes, we approve, but we have these very important recommendations that need to be met. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got. I likely missed a lot. I think that was great. Thank you for that. And so uh, I'll just share that, you know, as we review these, we, we just, we have the same questions you guys do around sort of, you know, what do those numbers mean? Where did that money go? How did we use it? And how are, are we utilizing it, right? You know, so that our recommendations really do speak to the needs of the people we're serving in the state of Colorado. Um, any questions for us? I did um, just want to let the subcommittee know that um, after our last meeting and questions around, you know, performance hub and data collection and things like that, I did reach out to our data team and we we're going to have Jordan and Rhea attend the meeting Monday morning to hopefully get some of these questions answered, a little bit more clarification on data. Um, you know, I, I know this is just like, feels like an uphill battle, but we're climbing it together and, you know, I'm trying to reach out to the correct people to get us those resources and a little bit more clarification. So they will be uh, attending our Monday uh, morning meeting. So very much looking forward to that. And of course, the meeting will be recorded and it will be uploaded and everybody will be able to view that. Um, and I'll be uh, just keeping you all in the loop with all of the letter, uh, excuse me, letter recommendation working documents, as well as the video recordings for anybody who would like to go and view those at a later date. Thank you. Any additional questions? And if not, we can get back on track and move along to our next agenda item. Yeah. And hearing no additional questions, we are going to Get ahead of schedule <laughs> and talk about um prevention so 988 take it away caitlin yes so i just got an email from the commissioner's office i believe it was tuesday um that we have a upcoming 988 informational schedule or session scheduled um so this is open to the public we would love your feedback and your participation I know um, a lot of the members of this council, some specifically, have a lot of questions about 988 and kind of where that future trajectory lies. And so wanted just to give you all a heads up and, and uh, inform you all that an informational schedule, no, informational session has been scheduled, <laughs> a lot of S's, um, uh, for Wednesday, July 31st at 12 o'clock p.m. And there is the link for the registration. I'm also going to drop the registration link in the chat right now. Um, let me. I beat you to it. Ah, oh, that never you happens. <laughs> okay, sorry. She Very was. proud of myself. So yes. Um, so please feel free to register there. Um, hopefully you'll be able to get, you know, a lot of good information about um, 988, that future trajectory. And um, I think that there will be a QA and a session at the end to get a little bit more of your questions answered. So just wanted to inform you all that that is coming up. I just got that uh, notice, I believe it was on Tuesday. So wanted just to disseminate that information to you all. Um, so any questions about that?
Don't see any questions. You guys register, learn, ask questions. If you, someone you love, or your community relies on crisis support, it's important to have our voices present in this conversation, um, especially knowing that this organization is an out-of-state organization that is just now integrating into the state of Colorado. It will be important that they hear from our expertise as well. Um, no questions there. We'll move on to treatment, updates on treatment from anyone in the group. Treatment. Nothing, everything's going great in the treatment world. No problems, that's fabulous news. Um, recovery, how are we doing in recovery? Also, just, just hitting it out of the park right after a holiday weekend in recovery. Good <laughs> job, prevention teams. Um, I, I'm, not seeing, I'm not seeing our usual suspects yeah. that, usually, that usually share out what's, what's going on. But I do know that tomorrow or Saturday night at Trax, they're doing a fundraiser. They do a fundraiser. They do a drag show fundraiser every um, year and our Colorado artists in recovery are the ones that are the recipients of the funding that comes from it this weekend. So if you can make it to tracks, I'll try to find the um, stuff and put it in the chat. Thank you. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna Thank be lots you. of fun. And you I said think it's Saturday night? Yes, yeah, Saturday night from 6 30 to 9 so for those of us older people we're like yes <laughs> we'll be home by 10. <laughs> <laughs> hey I just turned 30 and I'm all about like a 9 30 p.m bedtime like <laughs> awesome that's great and I love that we're talking about drag shows on this meeting thank you thank you everyone um legislative updates um Andrea you're up. I am indeed. Um, so uh, we're well past session now. Um, we are kind of in the in-between times with uh, preparing legislation for next year that we're only allowed to talk about up to a certain extent. And then like working on our implementation plans for the number of bills that passed that were behavioral health adjacent. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole litany of them. I know this council's already done that to some extent, but this is more of a uh, top level report out to say, as we work on our implementation plans, um, I anticipate that some of that discussion will go to this council and be talked about with um, some of the bills I'm specifically thinking of more so are the children's and youth plan adjacent, which is definitely relevant to this council um, as we work through with different divisions within BHA and get those plans rolling. Um, so I anticipate that you'll be seeing some agenda item requests for that uh, from our side over the next several meetings, I would guess. If, they, if you guys have any specific questions or specific like this bill what does it mean for our council or even not the behavioral health system in general please let us know what those are specifically so that i can come prepared with not just like nobody wants to hear me just geek out on legislation i assure you i do <laughs> <laughs> hey i've got some volunteers okay any don't... questions for andrea before i ask no? Okay, so Andrea, I would love to know about the rulemaking processes for um, these individual, you know, you talk about the implementation plans. So I know that yes. several bills, um, 1038 sticks out to me, but um, just in general, where are you all in rule right now? And, you know, just as far as like what's going to what department and how, you know, how, how are we as a council and as individuals, whether we're providers or advocates, able to keep track of making sure that we know like, where those rules are going to live, like who's implementing them, how they're being implemented. It's kind of the overarching questions around what happens to the policy after. So rule yes. is a big one. 
Exactly. And um, just uh, for framing reference, right, we've got the statutes that are changed by the bills during legislative session, January to May, right? And then the, those statutes, the will of the General Assembly will tell us to do a thing. Largely, state agencies accomplish that thing via their rulemaking authority, which I think is what Megan's referring to here, um, mostly. And the BHA is responsible for promulgating it's a fancy thousand dollar word, um, making these rules come into existence. And the rules can touch on a really wide variety of topics. The legislation will tell us what we have the authority to enact them about. BHA is currently in the process of drafting all those rules to be stakeholdered that are adjacent. Again, 1038, Megan, you're on that one with me primarily. So um, we're starting to look at the actual regulatory mechanisms for enacting those, which is so much stakeholdering and collaboration. That's what we're really aiming to get right this year with our administrative rule set. I want, would like to differentiate sort of rule sets that you hear at the BHA because we also have a provider rules. This is what we were talking about more last year for those entities that we regulate directly, like hold a license for or a designation for in some ways, right? And as the system's reforming and changing, those rules are getting massive overhauls. And that's been a lot of what's been at State Board of Human Services because we're a type two entity. That's just how those provider rules run that track. Um, we also have rule sets available to us at BHA that cover much more expansive material than just the providers that we regulate directly, right? Those systems rules, which is more what we're talking about here and what will be heavily stakeholdered throughout the summer and the fall. Did that answer that or was that just a lot of words for- well you know, how do we as a council get the information about that stakeholdering process and what will look different? As we know in the past, some of those stakeholdering processes have been a lot of kind of listening, but maybe not responding to or incorporating the feedback. Um, and how do we see that looking different moving forward? Got it. Um, so I, I don't want to jump in too much over my community engagement division and some of they've been working extensively on our stakeholdering plans within BHA for a number of topics, rules being at top of mind for me just because I live in policy land, but I know that's true of a number of different uh, things. So I will say that I know rules by their very nature have to be publicly announced. Y'all need to know what's going on with them, what that content is. And we know we've had some procedural like, oh, Lord, mishaps with some of getting that out. I don't anticipate that to be a problem this year, which is one huge change that I think I can say from BHA side that will help a lot. Um, outside of that, I'm pretty sure our, like I said, our community engagement team has been working extensively on these plans. So I would propose that we bring them to um, any of these meetings really. And then sort of before this kicks off like fall months, right? To say, here's what stakeholdering is gonna look like for these rules and how that matters to this council. Thank you. Andrea, I can jump in briefly. Ah. Megan, I don't, so with the screen share, people fall to the bottom and I didn't know if you were still here. I'm sorry. Everybody, I just nope. want to give you a heads up. It looks like our meeting's ending in less than one minute too. So if we leave, <laughs> this is a nightmare. So feel free to jump back on if you, if you would like. I know it's the last 10 minutes, but we can do it all over again. So feel free to jump back on. Um, just, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. And it's our public comment time too. So yes. I, I, I think we should all jump back on so we can give the yes. time to the public. <laughs> I'm so sorry, it everyone. Is. This is insane. Well, I'll start talking and then um, I can repeat myself <laughs> if needed. <laughs> um, I was just going to say yes to everything Andrea was explaining. We have been working extensively on a framework for stakeholder engagement, and that will be how BHA does stakeholdering throughout the across all divisions, everything that we're doing. And Megan, I know you've attended some BHAC meetings as well. And so we've really been utilizing an approach of sharing out information 